morning, everybody. We'll just move right on to Philippians because that's where we are in our study. Mark's been doing an amazing job, of course, you know, in leading us into this amazing book of joy, book of joy and of rejoicing. And it's amazing how counterintuitive sometimes joy and rejoicing is in the context of Paul, which is really suffering and hardships and difficulties and challenges. But what I want to present to you today is the idea that in the context of things happening in our lives, around us, or maybe even to us, some things we happened and some things happened to us. Nevertheless, in all things, it's possible, as you'll see today, by Paul's example, to rejoice. So grab your Bible or your pad or your phone, whatever it is you use to look into God's Word, and go with me to chapter 1, and let's pick up reading together in verse 12. Things happen, so rejoice. Here we go. You know, I never do push these buttons just right. Try it one more time. Yep. Yep. How about if I hold it for three? Did it go? Ha <laughs> ha! Hallelujah. Okay, here we go. So we're in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul writing. Still an introduction of the letter, by the way, essentially. Now getting more to the purpose of the writing. He's had some warm, wonderful thoughts, prayers, and expressions of gratitude toward the church at Philippi. It was very near and dear to his heart. But now he says in verse 12, I want you to know, let's be sure, that there's something to know here. I want you to know, brothers, Aldelfoy, that what's happened to me, has anything ever happened to you? Paul says, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It's crazy how that happened. Something happened, and it wasn't a great happening, but actually what happened served. Think about that. Served to advance the gospel so that, and the explanation, it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. This is all about Jesus. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my chains or imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some, indeed, preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me, in my imprisonment. It's interesting that there are two groups of people, we'll dig into this in just a moment, but one group is just clear that this is all about the gospel and Paul's defense. The other group, well, it's just selfish ambition with a weird kind of goal to afflict more pain and more suffering on Paul in his context. What then, verse 18, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, here it is, Christ is proclaimed, and in that, what did he do? What did he do? I rejoice. Sometimes you just got to say the word. Uh, you you got to express that joy and gratitude and thanksgiving. And with this, I want you to notice with me as we dig down now a little bit more into the text. With the understanding and the idea that what we really like to have is a sunny day. What we really would appreciate is a straight path and a sunny day to enjoy it. Gentle breeze blowing, maybe the sound of a few birds tweeting. Level ground, peace, everything we need to get where we're going. And the joy to enjoy the journey. That's what we'd really like to have. And sometimes we do. Aren't you glad for those days? There are some sunny days. Thank God for them. Uh, but, of course, as you know, uh, not every day can be, can be a sunny day. Uh, sometimes the sun goes down. And sometimes we're surrounded by darkness. And sometimes we're in the deep of the night. Some call it a dark darkness of the soul. Sometimes we just go down into it. Things happen. Things change. And we find ourselves in the context of something that has happened. Paul says, I want you to know that the things that, that have happened to me, think about that, when things happen. It could be as simple as you're on your way home 
and you hit a traffic jam. And there you sit. Could be just as simple as a happening like that. Could be, however, that when you get home, you get a call from the doctor's office and he says, the tests, I'm sorry to tell you, were positive and we need to meet to talk about next steps in your treatment. And something happens. Could be as simple as a challenging boss. Nobody's ever had one of those. Nobody here, I'm sure. But but somebody over you who's just making your life miserable. Could be a happening like that and you're wondering... (laughs) God, you got to move him or her or me. This is not going to work. Or, or it could be more than a happening like a tough boss. It could be the happening like a career change midstream or midlife. Didn't expect to see that coming. It could be the end of a relationship. Because sometimes, sadly, relationships end. Or it could be the loss of a loved one. Things happen. Things happen. And and that's just a fact, y'all. Let's just go ahead and agree to the fact that sometimes things happen and things happen to all of us sooner or later. Now, I'm not here to give you the Debbie Downer. If your name's Debbie, that's not about you. That's just a phrase. I'm not here to to put a wet blanket on your 4th of July fireworks display. I'm, I'm just wanting to start where Paul is in the context of a Roman imprisonment for the sake of the gospel, for the defense of the gospel, dealing with all that's happened to him. We're tempted when we're in these times to ask this question, why me? Or why now? But I want to suggest kind of at the outside that there might be a a better question to ask when we're in these happenings, and that would be to ask, to what end? What's this all about? What's the purpose Is there a point to this? What we'd be doing really when we ask that question is moving more in the direction of trying to discern what is it in this or about this or from this could result in God getting the glory. In other words, our impulse is to say, what? Why? Maybe through training our mind, Developing and deepening our faith, we could learn to ask more quickly the question, Hey, what's going on here? Lord, what are you doing? Or, what are you about to do? I tell you, if we could just train our brains to think like this, that when that conversation happens, or when that phone call comes, when those test results are returned, when that relationship hits the rocks, that our first impulse could be a faith response, a trust response, where we would say, Lord, this is bad. I can't wait to see how you're going to bring good from it. Now, I'm going to back that up, but I want to do it in the text. So let's go a little bit further. When we discover our joy is in the glory of God, how then in the things that happen to us, how does God get the glory and we the joy? So... Let's have a roadmap because if we're going to get there through this dark night of the soul, I think as Spurgeon called it, if we're going to get there, we're going to need to pick up a few things on the way, like a kingdom mindset. We'll start there. And then we want to pick up eyes of faith. We want to see through the lens of faith. We want to interpret what we see from a faith perspective. And then thirdly, on our roadmap, we're going to settle on Christ-centered priorities. We need to pick these three, three things up as we go. Uh, one, a kingdom mindset, refers to our theological predisposition, or maybe we call it a faith perspective. It's just how we think. It's how we see the world. It's how we process information. It's from a faith perspective or a kingdom mindset. I don't know who said it first or when, but you've heard perhaps the phrase, as we think, so we are. Thinking is a powerful activity. What you think really drives, oftentimes, what happens next how you think, how you process, how you move through these in your mind, these circumstances. Maybe heard it a different way, attitude determines altitude. Attitude determines altitude. Back to the text, let's see how Paul takes it. I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me, what's happened to me? Let's start there and and take this verse in two parts. What's happened to me? 
In the Greek, it's really kind of a simple phrase that speaks of the things concerning me, the, the things concerning me, ta kat e me, the things concerning me, my case, Paul might say. What's happened to me? And what he says is, is I, I want you to know what has happened to me, sort of, but not really. Because in reality, they know what's happened to Paul. It's part of the occasion of his letter is to, to respond to their concerns about what has happened to Paul. They knew uh, what had happened to him. They knew about the Jerusalem mob, no doubt. They knew about his two years in Caesarea, the threats to his life. They knew about his trip to Rome. And oh, by the way, a uh, shipwrecked and snake bit along the way. They knew what had happened to Paul. And they were deeply concerned, afraid, we might even say, because what does this mean? How do we process this? What are we to think about this? What mindset should we have in light of the things that have happened to Paul? His ministry is in jeopardy. His life may be in danger. And what of the ministry of the gospel? If Paul is imprisoned, how will the gospel advance? The one who brought the gospel to us is confined and imprisoned in Rome. So they knew what had happened. But there's more to the story they didn't know, and that's more specifically what Paul is talking to them about. When he says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, which you know, has another result or effect. Rather, it has really served to advance the gospel. Didn't know that, did you? I mean, in your, your initial sort of natural way of looking at this, bad things happened to me. And you know about that, but what I want you to know that you may not know is that the things that happened to me actually have served a greater purpose. Those same things that you rightly are concerned about, me too, because they happened to me. <laughs> Those things, really? Well, what they've served to do is to advance the gospel. That word that you see there, the, the, the Greek word, and, and David can help me with my pronunciation whenever it's off, but eleleuthin is the word that says to, to turn it around, to turn it out, to, to, to bring it out. And, and really, Malone, really, it's really turned out, served, to advance the gospel. And that Greek word is a really wonderful, powerful, full of imagery kind of word, prokopain. It means pioneer advancement. It's a, it's a Greek military term, actually. It would refer perhaps to the engineers who would go out ahead of the, the army and the soldiers and clear a path through a really dense forest or a rugged terrain. Or the scouts that would go out ahead to scout out the terrain, to, to look for opportunities, to find new areas into which to move. Gospel advancement, pioneering kind of advancement. You know what Paul's saying in his choice of this word? He's saying the things that have happened to me have been the cause of new opportunities. That had those things not happened to me, this may not have come. It's a pioneer advance. The things that have happened to me have really served a greater purpose. Another reason for these things wasn't just my suffering or a setback to the gospel, but in fact what seems to be a setback is actually a step forward into the greater mission of God. These things that have happened to me, they've really served to advance the gospel into new territory. Now, Paul recognizes this, I think, in part because of his kingdom mindset that he has acquired through experience. A week or so ago, Mark took you back to Acts 16 in the work up to the letter to the church at Philippi, to Paul's coming to Philippi. You remember the story? Let me take you there again. Acts chapter 16. Notice, this is the story of Paul, a great missionary journey. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. They wanted to go to Asia. Their plan was to go to Asia. All their preparations were to move them in the direction of Asia, but it didn't work out. It didn't come to pass. Things happened. Specifically, in this case, the Holy Spirit said no. Good thing Paul and his missionary companions weren't 
brats about it. They just said, well, closed door, let's go a different direction. Verse 7, and when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. More frustration over unmet expectation. Things are happening, and they're not the things they'd planned. They're not the purposes they had. It's not the direction they wanted to go. It's not the destination they had in mind. So, verse 8, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So really, if you add up the numbers, they're, they're on their third plan. You, you plan A, plan B, plan C. And here they are. And when they are, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia standing there, urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia. Which direction is Macedonia? You've seen the map. Mark showed you the map. Which direction is Macedonia? Is it east? No. Is it north? No. Is it south? No. It's west. Did Paul want to go west? No. Was Paul planning to go west? No. Did Paul see any opportunities or possibilities in the west? Apparently not. He wanted to go every other direction but west. But every door was closed. So what did he do? And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that... concluding. So there's a thought process. Things have happened. We're not getting what we want. We're not getting what we think we need. We're not going where we'd rather go. Instead, hey, this must be God directing us in the direction of Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What is that? That's gospel advance. That's pioneer advancement into new areas of opportunity that may not have come had Paul not had things happen to redirect his steps and to send him in a completely different direction in his life and ministry. We call that, I think, a good word is a kingdom mindset. It's how we think. It's the paradigm or the lens. It's, it's how we process information. When things happen, our first thought, well, in the flesh is, oh, me, why me? But upon some discipleship and training and, and renewing of the mind, we, we come with this kingdom mindset to view things as possibilities for pioneer advancement. God, where are you leading? God, where, where is this going? What's going to happen here? What's going to work out here? And what we know from the scriptures from the first to the last chapter of God's word is this. That whatever we think we see with our natural eyes is not all there is to be seen. And through the eyes of faith, through the lens of faith, with a mind that begins to process in response to the things that happen to us, Lord, what are you doing? God, what are you up to here? Jesus, something's happened. I sure am glad you're in the midst of it. And I sure am thankful that you have a plan and purpose to use it because, listen to me, folks, there is a skyscraper of a promise with a foundation on the rock of God himself that says to us, hey, you know this. Don't forget this. Think this way. Process happenings in this way that for those who love God, all things, Work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, if you don't have this verse of Scripture memorized, please, today, commit this verse to memory. You're going to need it. <laughs> because things are going to happen, and when they do, you're going to initially begin to think, oh, me, why me? Instead of, oh, boy, God, as bad as this seems, I can't wait to see how you're going to use it for my good and for your glory. This is a promise from God. You should memorize it. And you, if you love God and are called according to His purpose, you're the beneficiary of this promise. You are. This is to you, believer in Christ. Uh, you've been called 
You've been justified. You want to unpack this verse? Just read verses 29 and 30 of Romans chapter 8, and you'll see the called according to his purpose. The called whom he also justified. Who he justified, he also glorified. He's talking about you. You're the beneficiary of this promise from God. And that phrase, that that qualifier, that restrictive phrase, all things, isn't very restrictive. All things. Think of a thing that's happened to you. That's an all thing. Think of things that haven't happened to you. That those are all things. And, and you say, well, hold on a minute. I, I'm not asking for it. No, you don't have to. Don't worry. It doesn't need your permission to happen. Things happen. But we know this is how we think. This is our theological predisposition. This is our faith perspective. This is the paradigm of our life. We know that for those who love God, I love God. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Don't neglect to memorize. Keep on the front of your mind. Keep that verse always before you so that whatever comes to you has to pass through the filter of, hey, isn't this one of those all things, Lord? Is this one of those all things, Father? Because you know if it comes to you, it's going to be father filtered before it gets to you or it never make it to you. If it makes it to you, it's because God has a plan and purpose for it, in it, through it, to bring good from it. For who? For you. Because you're his child and he loves you. So what we see when we see it this way, when we think this way, stumbling blocks are just stepping stones. Challenges, well, they're just opportunities for God to turn our test into a testimony of His glory and of His grace and of His goodness and of His faithfulness and of His care for you and for me. Every test, every challenge, every stumbling block, every setback could be a step forward of pioneer advancement. Number one, here's what we've said. To get through this happening... We're going to need a kingdom mindset. And you have to nurture that and you have to practice that until it becomes second nature or first nature. So how I choose to think, it impacts what I see. This kingdom perspective then becomes the lens through which I watch the world and God's work around me. And what did Paul see through the lens of faith, our second stop along the way? Let's see. Pick up with me in verse 13. So, meaning that things that have happened to me have really served to advance the gospel, pioneer advancement, to move into new areas of of expression, of opportunity, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. What Paul is saying, this situation, these circumstances, my suffering has actually provided for me a platform from which to give evidence to the unsaved. Look at it in verse 13. It's become known. Phanerus. It's become known. It's, it's to make what is unknown known and to make it clear, to make it obvious. It's, it's really clear, Paul says, and Paul sees, that God is working and God is using my happenings my circumstances, my situation, my suffering to reveal or to make known, obviously known, throughout the whole imperial guard, throughout the whole praetorian. Now, if you do a little study on this, you you know who this is. It's a place, but it's also a a people group. Uh, These are the Roman soldiers who are battle-hardened. They're vicious killing machines. These are the meanest men on planet Earth. And these particular soldiers, these praetorian, you see the word there, praetorio, these these particular ones are the elite among the elite. They're the baddest of the bad and the bestest of the best. They're Caesar's own guards. And, And that's where Paul's spending every waking moment and every sleeping moment of his life because he's he's chained up to one of them at least. In continually changing shifts 24-7. Can you imagine being tied to your jailer? Chained to a battle-hardened, vicious killer of men. That would have been a tough assignment. 
But remember, Paul has a kingdom mindset, and now he's looking around to see where there might be those expressions of God's activity, where he might see in this happening God working. And what does he see? Well, he sees a soldier that he's chained to 24-7. You got me. (laughs) I'm not going anywhere. Can't hurt you. You got me. That is one way of looking at it, but I I think with the kingdom perspective that we know Paul had, with this mindset, and and with the vision towards where God is working, that what Paul was really saying when he said, you got me, is, well, while I got you, I I mean, while I got your attention, I mean, while we're spending this time together, (laughs) I mean, it's one way to see this situation as, you got me, and I'm mad about it, and I'm sad about it, and I'm disappointed in it. And I just would choose anything other than to be chained to you. But you got me. What can I do about it? Sit here and complain and whine and moan. Or, hi, my name's Paul. Nice to meet you. Since we'll be spending some time together, let me tell you a little bit about my story. (laughs) You You see the difference that attitude can make? You see how attitude can determine altitude? You see, how we think is so often how we are and how we behave and what we're able to do. And Paul sees an opportunity. Here we go. Gospel advance, pioneer advancement. Who in the world ever got a one-on-one conversation with one Praetorian guard after another, after another, after another, after another to tell them all about Jesus and what are they going to do about it? Think about the conversations Paul had with the brothers. Think about the letters that he's dictating that are being written. Think about all of the gospel conversations and the Jesus talk that's, and the attitude and the expressions of joy that those tough Roman soldiers must have thought, this guy's lost it. I'm telling you, if I were in his condition, I certainly, certainly wouldn't be rejoicing. What's he talking about rejoice? What's he talking about joy? Who does he think he is? Do you ever wonder if maybe one of them just reach over and just backhand him just for the fun of it? And how does he respond to that? How does he take that? What does he do about that? Does he say, thank you, may I have more, please? Or does he seize even that opportunity as an opportunity to say, in the name of Jesus, I forgive you. And with the love of Jesus, I'd love just to have a simple conversation with you. One guard after another, while I have you. Let's take full advantage of this opportunity. But more than just his guards, by the way, there's a larger audience for the gospel here. It's become known throughout the whole imperial guard, those are the Praetorians, and to all the rest. Who are the rest? Who are they? What others were in areas that the gospel had not yet penetrated, advanced, until Paul, through his situation, circumstances, and the happenings of his life, now have a new entree. And there he is. Who might they be? Who are these others? Well, there's a clue, I think, in chapter 4, verse 22. In the conclusion of the letter, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and he says, All the saints greet you, especially those of whose household? Caesar's household. Which, by the way, if you remember the whole point and purpose of Paul going to Rome, he's going there to make a defense of the gospel and apologia before Caesar himself. It's his right as a Roman citizen which he has exercised. So one of the things that happened to Paul, which nobody else would think was a good thing to happen to anyone, is an all-expense-paid trip to Rome. And a couple of years in prison, and a few dozen to a few hundred of the hardest soldiers chained to him. And those in Caesar's household who are starting to hear these stories and these conversations about this man and how he's responding to this and what's happening as a result of this. Maybe the rest are those in Caesar's own household. This is before his defense of the gospel, officially before the emperor. So Paul is already infecting the household of Caesar with the gospel just by virtue of his presence there and his response to the things that have happened there. And people are coming to Christ already in Caesar's household. It didn't take them long to figure out. It was obvious. It was made clear, right? Made clear, obvious. What was unknown? Made known. Fauneros, what? 
that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, if Mark were here, he'd dig a little deeper into this particular phrase because it's a bit awkward in the original language, but I I just want to sort of summarize the end of that wonderful discussion with this statement. Paul is a prisoner of Christ, and that's the only reason he's a prisoner of Rome. They knew this guy didn't do anything deserving of being in this condition or this situation or have had these things happen to him. They knew that. That was clear and obvious. This is no dangerous criminal. This guy's not an insurrectionist. He's not here to burn Rome to the ground. The emperor will take care of that. <laughs> this guy's here because of his love and devotion to someone who died on a cursed tree and was buried. And he says was raised again on the third day. Can you believe that? I tell you, I don't know if I believe it, but I tell you what, he does. I tell you, you cannot miss his conviction. Because let me tell you, anybody else would have said, oh, never mind. But this guy has put himself through all of these very uncomfortable happenings, rejoicing along the way, because without question, he believes what he believes. And you know, the more I'm around the guy, which I don't have any choice in because they chained me to him, (laughs) I'm starting to wonder if he might be right. Because I haven't seen a chink in his armor. I I haven't seen a blind spot. I haven't been able to say, aha, got you. It's a lie. You're a phony. But consistently living his life before them in the worst of circumstances has become evidence to them of the truth of the gospel that he proclaims. My imprisonment is for Christ. I'm here for Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. So his life is now a sermon for all to see. Let's go a little bit further. Most of the brothers, in fact, not just to the lost and to the unsaved or the sinners chained to him or those of Caesar's household around him. No, more than that, uh, he sees God working in this way. Secondly, most of the brothers and brothers being brothers and sisters, plural, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, not by my freedom, but by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So one of the results of Paul's suffering is the platform from which to preach not only to the community, but to lead in the context of the congregation. They're watching too. They know what's happened also. They're having enough interaction with Paul to be encouraged by his courage. He's making a difference. So much so that uh, Paul piles up these amazing words, having become confident, much more bold. In the Greek, we could say more abundantly to dare fearlessly. This is a multiplication or amplification of courage and boldness based on on what they see Paul going through, and more importantly, how he's handling what's happening to him. And it's become for them an opportunity to stand up. Now think about this. What happened to Paul could be an occasion for those around Paul to sit down and to shut up. Because we don't want what's happening to Paul to happen to us. But instead, God is working And the Holy Spirit is empowering and emboldening through Paul's strong witness and example. And you know what they're saying? My goodness, if Paul can do that, I'm just a shopkeeper. I can do this. There's no doubt Paul is a normal part of the conversation. His fame has preceded him. No no doubt. There are people who know about this Paul. And what he's been through and what he's going through and what's ahead of him and why. For there to be more than enough conversations for a shopkeeper to say, yeah, I know about that guy. And you know, I've been thinking about that. I've, I've actually been listening carefully and I've come to a conclusion. Can I tell you what this is all about? And Paul's chains and Paul's imprisonment becomes a platform over which a shopkeeper can share the gospel. The word, by the way, in the language, lay line, Uh, That doesn't mean to preach from a pulpit. It's just everyday conversation. So what's happening to Paul, which is no doubt a pulpit for him, is just an occasion for them to simply say, 
hey, let me tell you what I know about Paul. Let me tell you why I think he's doing what he's doing. Let's have a conversation about his motives and what it means, why it matters. Most of the brothers are having more conversations with a greater level of confidence in the Lord by the things that are happening to Paul, such that they're speaking more boldly the Word of God without fear. So what we want to pause here and remember now, it's a little moment of application, is whenever something happens to us, not only is the world watching to see how we respond, but those in the world of faith are also watching, those who are behind us, coming along after us. They're watching and they're learning. Picking up on those clues. And, and using that information, that evidence, to determine the validity of your claims to Christ. People in your life group around you, when, when you offer up a prayer request, you're giving a signal. When you have a conversation in the hallway or over at the donut table or at the coffee pot or just coming in or out of the building, you have having a conversation about the things that have happened to you, you're saying more than you think you're saying to the person you're saying it to. You share that with your children. You share that with your parents. You share that with a sibling. You share that with your neighbor. You share that with your coworker. You are saying more than you know you're saying if before you've said, I'm with Jesus. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ. I love the Lord. His way is best. The gospel is true. Oh, no, let me tell you what happened to me. As if nothing I just said matters in the moment when it matters most. I hear the sound of toes withdrawing. Mine too. Because all of us, if we aren't careful, have the opportunity to devalue what we value most in the moments and times when things happen to us. But folks, listen to me. Those are the moments in time. That's when a strong witness for the Lord, a A faith-based testimony in the Lord. Confidence in the Lord. Boldness in the Lord. Those are the times that matter the most. Anybody can be a great Christian on one of those beautiful, sunny, nothing's happening much today except good. Anybody can do that. But let me tell you who you are. Trained. Discipled having your mind renewed and transformed, thinking a different way, having this mind of Christ who, by the way, we might just go ahead and say, had a lot happen to him. But in the course of those happenings, kept the faith. Like Paul, he ran the race, he finished the course. It is finished, Jesus said. And the world was watching. And those who had followed him were waiting to see if in this final, ultimate test, he would bear witness with his life to the truth of what he's told us. Remember, like the brothers, most of them anyway, I wonder why he says most of them. (laughs) I wonder if he had somebody in mind. Uh, Except this guy, I know this guy, he's a coward. She is just chicken. She won't tell anybody about Jesus for anything. Or they're ashamed of me, what's happened to me. But most, that's the good news, most of the brothers are more bold and more encouraged based on Paul's courage to speak, to say something about God. Look, I know and I get it. uh, Fear of public speaking is still one of the greatest fears known to man. It really is. I mean, people say to me, "I, I, I wish or I don't ever want to or I could never speak publicly. Hey, I get it. Terrifies me too. Probably should, right? Especially when we get up to speak on behalf of the Lord. Whoa, that's a weight of responsibility. But but here's what I want to tell you is this isn't about your public proclamation from the pulpit. This just is about you taking advantage of an opportunity to say something good about Jesus in your context, in the midst of something happening to you. This is your opportunity to speak. You don't have to get up behind the pulpit. You don't have to beat the Bible. You don't have to 
proclaim it from the mountaintops like some wonderful prophets of old or preachers of recent history. That's not your calling, perhaps. But let me tell you, most of us, I hope, are encouraged by the example and the courage of Paul and others that we could use time and time again, examples of people who in the midst of their happenings kept happening for Jesus and made it known. I hear people in hospital rooms over the course of my ministry share the gospel with a nurse or a doctor or a therapist or a technician who walks into their room either to stick them or to prod them or to tell them something they don't want to hear. Or maybe to say some good news. Hey, the tests have come back good. You're looking good. We're going to get you out of here. And you know, and you know what I've heard in, in hospital rooms, on hospital beds, in the midst of the happenings of life, I've heard people say, well, glory to God. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you why that makes me happy. Because this gives me another opportunity to tell more people about the Jesus who loves me and whom I love. There's so many stories. So listen, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your opportunity difficulties, challenges, obstacles, suffering, they don't disqualify you. They qualify you. They're not impediments to the gospel. They are platforms for gospel proclamation. They are opportunities or pulpits, if you will, from which you can share your faith in Jesus and the gospel of the Lord Jesus, where you can tell others about your trust in Him and His faithfulness to you. So yeah, your pain... That's your pulpit. That's the place from which you proclaim as softly as you like to as few as you want. But that circumstance, that situation, that happening is your pulpit from which to preach. So, sister, preach it. Brother, preach it. Don't miss it. Don't waste it. Don't let it get away from you because... God doesn't waste a drop of our suffering. Why should we use it? Because you know God wants to use it. Third and last, we've talked about a kingdom mindset and the eyes of faith through which we see where God is working and how so that, of course, we can join Him in His activity, so we can be a part of God's activity, His work, so we can get in on it, not miss it, but there's a third stop along the way. This is our roadmap, And that would be the stop of Christ-centered priorities. Because I cannot choose what happens to me. I cannot choose how others respond, as we'll see in the next few verses. I can't decide. I can't predetermine. I can't figure out even why they do what they do or respond how they do. But I'm me, and, and I can choose how I respond. And I can determine in advance, with my theological disposition and my eyes of faith, that however it happens, whatever happens, for whatever reason it happens, I'm going to stay focused and keep the main thing the main thing. That I can choose to do. Listen to verse 15. Somewhat of a surprise in the narrative here. And speaking, no doubt, of those who are more emboldened to speak, which is a good thing. More people are speaking about Jesus. That's a good thing. But interestingly enough, in verse 15, Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Really? Can you do that? I thought motives matter. <laughs> well, they do, of course, which speaks to their blessing. But it doesn't hinder the message that they're preaching. The message is right. Paul doesn't have an issue with the message. Now, when there's a problem with the message, he's happy to speak to it, as we saw in the a letter to the Galatians, there's no question if it's untruth or if it's a mixture of error which makes it untrue, if it's ungodly, if it's not right, he'll speak to that. But in this case, they're not saying something wrong. They're just saying it for the wrong reasons. It's their motives that are called into question here. Some preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. Two groups. The latter, those who preach from goodwill, uh, they do it out of love no doubt love of God, love of me, knowing that I'm put here, the reason I'm here, my point and purpose of being here is for the defense of the gospel, apologia. It's, it's why I'm here. 
He's saying, my friends know who I am, they know why I'm here, and they know what I'm all about, and it's the gospel. Paul has put himself into this position, if you will. He's chosen this. Not that God didn't orchestrate it and direct it, of course. The things that have happened to him provided the platform for which these things can happen. But here he is to defend the gospel, to explain it, to defend it against the accusations of untruth, to tell exactly what it is and what it means and why it matters and why you should respond with yes to the gospel of Jesus. That's what I'm all about, Paul says. Verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. My goodness, really? Can you do that? I mean, can can church growth be your main motivation? Can outdoing Paul be your main motivation? Can can having a bigger Bible study than old so-and-so, can that be your motivation? Yeah, it can and often is. And it's sad when it is. When somebody has lost focus, missed the main thing, they think they're the thing or their ministry is the thing or their platform is the thing, or the results they're having is the thing. It's easy to get distracted. It's quite easy when things are happening to lose focus and to get off to some minor thing. And they're thinking sincerely, no. Instead, to afflict me in my imprisonment. They're jealous of Paul. They want, they're going to do him harm. This is a really challenging verse of Scripture, these two or three here, I, I'm, I'm willing to say. We really... We don't have time to to unpack them. We really don't know specifically or exactly who they are. Of course, there are factions in Rome. We know that. There are Jews and there are Gentiles, and there are different kinds of Jews and different kinds of Gentiles. There are the ins and there are the outs. There are those who are for Paul, and there are those who are not so for Paul. All we really know is that there are two groups of people. One group is described as envious and rivaling Paul. They're selfish in their ambition, and they're just trying to inflict more harm or pain to Paul. In the sharing of the gospel. I grant you, it's a hard motive to swallow, but at least the message is right. There's another group of goodwill with love for and understanding that Paul is there for the defense of the gospel, and they're in support of Paul. There there are these two groups. Right message, wrong motives for one. Right message, right motives for the other. I don't know much else to say about this, but I can tell you one thing I'm happy to say about group one. I mean, I'm happy there's a group two. We always need the support of our friends and family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We always want to be in group two, don't we? Hello? We always want to be in group two. We don't want to be jealous and envious or motivated by selfish ambition. We want to be motivated by love and kindness. We want to be in support of the gospel. And we want to be for those who are for us. But as to the other group, group one, I can tell you this. I'm so glad God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. (laughs) I don't know who actually said that first. It's attributed to Ignatius of Loyola. I I heard that uh, Martin Luther said it. People have said it through the centuries. I guess because it's true, and thankfully so, because we're all crooked sticks. We're all fallen, broken, unqualified, disqualified, except by the grace of God wherein we are qualified because of his righteousness, not our own. So even Paul is a crooked stick that God uses to draw a straight line. And the straight line is the gospel. And that's the point. As far as Paul is concerned, notice what he says. What then, verse 18, Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, I don't care. I mean, I care which group you're in. I'd rather you be in group two because I could use the support and the encouragement. I need your love and affection. I need your support. Thank you. But group two, well, I sure am glad that Paul's reputation was not the main thing. Nor Paul's ministry success, not the main thing. I'm really glad Paul didn't make Paul's ministry about Paul, but about Jesus. Because he says, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. That's the point, isn't it? Christ is proclaimed. So we've heard him say in these few verses, we're talking about the advancement, pioneer advancement of the gospel. We're talking about people speaking more boldly the gospel. We see here that Christ is proclaimed. We see it over and over again. Paul knows, do we what the main thing really is. 
that through all of the things that may happen to us, there is one thing we hope will happen, and that is through it all, the name of Jesus will be clear and obvious. The glory of God and honoring of Christ, and the message of Christ will be clearly communicated in, through, not in spite of, but in the midst of our circumstances, of the happenings of our lives. That's what we hope. And Paul, in that, Paul says, I rejoice. I rejoice. Notice, Christ is proclaimed, I rejoice. My reputation is suffering. (laughs) Oh, well. I'm never going to be a megachurch pastor, Paul says. Oh, well. Probably not going to put me on the cover of Church Growth Magazine. Oh, well. Good thing I never made it about me. Good thing, Paul says, I just tried to make it about Jesus. And with all that has happened to me, even as close to me as this circumstance of people preaching the gospel for or without good motives, at least Christ is preached and that's the main thing. And so I rejoice. And can we just be reminded that that's the mission and if that's happening, mission accomplished. And there's reason to rejoice when it is. I mean, I want to take us back in the moment or so that we have before we close to the cross, to the heart of the gospel message that we've been talking about, to Jesus. And ask the question, what if we lived Christ-centered lives? I mean, what if life's mission for us wasn't how to make ourselves more comfortable Or to enjoy more conveniences? What if our life's mission wasn't complacency, but commitment to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? What if we lived, truly think about this, what if we lived Christ-centered lives? In such a way that we could say with faith and courage and believing it to be true, that I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow or even today. But I am confident in this, to God be the glory. And if that happens, I rejoice. I'm not asking for trouble. I'm not looking for trouble. I certainly shouldn't go around and try to make trouble. Well, sometimes trouble happens. It's what you do next that makes the difference and matters the most. And so with that, we need this kingdom mindset Set before it happens. And we need the eyes of faith so that when it's happening, we can see what and perhaps why it's happening and how God is working so that we can become a part of God's activity in the midst of our happenings. And finally, to stay focused in those circumstances on our Christ-centered priorities, what we value the most, what matters the most, what means the most. That when all of this is said and done and everything has come and gone and all that's happening is happened, we can rejoice because at least God was glorified and Jesus was honored and the Holy Spirit had his way and the name of Jesus was proclaimed in small ways and in great ways. Jesus gets the victory. And if that's the main thing, then you can rejoice in the absolute worst of circumstances. Because let me tell you, that thing is going to happen. He's going to get the glory. He's going to get the praise. He's going to get the honor. And we rejoice. So maybe you're at uh, the place on the road of midnight sorrow. Maybe you're walking through a darkness. And you say, well, all that sounds good, but I, I'm not there yet. I, I get it. But here's my encouragement to you. Hang on. Keep believing. Keep watching. Because let me tell you something. It's not over until God is finished. And if you're still breathing, friend, God ain't finished. Because let me tell you, it's nothing for God to call your name and you to be done and gone. You're happening, ain't happening no more. But if you're still here, you're still breathing, your heart's still beating, God must still have a plan and purpose for your life. So keep waiting and keep watching to see where God is working because God is not finished. 
Now, it's true, and I empathize with you. Weeping tarries for the night. It's true. Don't hope you haven't misunderstood. Anything I've said, something bad happened, whoopee! No. I'm not naive. I know you're not naive. Things happen that get to the very heart of who we are and shake the very core and foundation of who we are. Things like that happen. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Friend, there is a morning in your future. Just put one foot in front of the other until the sun comes up. Father, we pray for the courage to believe that with our whole heart. To have our mindset in such a way that we are prepared in advance for the things that happen. That in those happenings we see where you're working, join you in that activity for your glory and for your good, knowing that in the end, if Jesus wins, we rejoice. So if we're in that dark night now, encourage us, strengthen us, help us. Keep walking towards Jesus, who is our light and salvation. We thank you, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.